Uh, yeah, but who are the people actually behind it? I mean, uh, is it international people who kind of give those ideas and put it into that legal language? <coughs> who are the people in the background that are kind of formulating that? Kind of Department of Justice lawyers, I think, yeah. who have argued the cases before the Supreme Court and lost them. Yeah. And, and, and <coughs> I mean, basically, there is a lot of ego in this. That what it is, what it is trying to do is resolve issues, but they're getting directions. I mean, what what the, the process is a very careful process. It's meant to be monitored, but when you have phrases like terrorism in general, you realize that. Somebody is sitting down and writing it in the back of the menu. Yeah, I asked Kent and Roach where they thought this stuff came from, and they said, well, you know, it looks like a bunch of ideas that have been sitting in the bottom of someone's drawer for a long time. And they thought, okay, now's our chance. Yeah, waiting for a minute. Uh, yeah. Would this, um, would this um, guidance uh, perhaps be coming from international sources like Homeland Security, think tanks? Well, I really don't know that the U.S. government wants CSIS agents going into the U.S. and breaking their laws either. Um, but it, it could. I mean, it's, 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 it's more draconian. I should say it's more draconian. There's less oversight in Canada than anywhere else, which is interesting. So if we were actually taking the model from other countries, we would be more prepared to have open public scrutiny. No other country has ever been asked to pass a law this draconian so quickly. Uh, the UK, by the way, just passed its Anti-Terrorism Act in response to what they're seeing happening around the world. And their bill focuses on creating programs in schools and in prisons to uh, deal with the radicalization of, of youth or prisoners in those contexts. And the, the attacks in Copenhagen and the attack in Paris appear to have been by people who were radicalized in prison. There's nothing in C-51 that does anything proactively to take someone like, I mean, to, by Friday we'll get there releasing the one minute tape made by the shooter from October 22nd in Ottawa, whom I do not believe was, could be described as a terrorist. But if we'd had program money for him to get drug addiction counseling and mental health uh, assistance, he was begging for it to a judge in Vancouver in December 2012. But the, the, the program there would have been an outreach to help with radicalization. There's nothing like that in this bill. Can I just respond to that too, just, sure. just to say, um, Elizabeth referred to the five eyes that New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States have ganged together to share information. And one of the problems here is we cannot be guaranteed of, the over, of oversight in other countries. It's a sort of garbage in, garbage out problem. Part of the, the Arar uh, issue and the, and the Abdul Razik issue is the information is not coming from us, it's coming from our partners. And we don't, we don't have the same uh, uh, support for that information. We, we, we can't inquire into where it came from. We just have to accept it if we're sharing information. And so it is a, a problem about, uh, about, there's a problem about, about Mutual involvement. Um, am I paranoid in assuming that a lot of this language is so vague uh, because they're trying to construct um, grounds for criminalizing people who dissent uh, on subjects like pipelines and uh, Tarzan? Well, you know, it, it, you, it's really hard to, to define that kind of concern as paranoid when we know that Enbridge paid for the coffee breaks when the RCMP, CSIS, and CSEC held the annual briefing for the oil industry about threats to the oil industry coming from environmental groups and First Nations. Those meetings are already happening. And some of you will have seen in the Globe and Mail the release of a report by, paper by the RCMP from a year ago describing people as anti-petroleum ideologues who claim that burning fossil fuels causes global warming and who <laughs> seem intent on ending the dependence on petroleum. And it said many of these groups are well-meaning and nonviolent, but we know that their activities can lead to violence. I, I also asked the Minister of Public Safety in question period if he was concerned about the lack of scientific knowledge of the RCMP 
and if we could arrange for them to be schooled in the science of climate change. Unfortunately, I didn't even get an answer from Stephen Blaney. Leona Glucock popped up and read her usual, we are reducing greenhouse gases through our sector by sector approach. So, But I mean, this is not paranoia. They're doing it now. They apparently don't feel they needed C-51 to decide to create surveillance on First Nations and environmental groups who are concerned about pipelines, tankers, and climate change. This will give them additional tools to do so, and they won't need a warrant unless they're about to violate our charter rights or a break a domestic law. Yes, I don't want to defend this law or the protest at all, but isn't changing the law in the face of objection by the Supreme Court a legitimate way that the law evolves? I mean, I know there's another argument to be made about you know, the quality or what exactly are they saying, but isn't that actually part of the way the process should work? I'll say something quick and then don't. If that's what they were doing, which is I think is what they're doing, then tell us that's what you're doing. Don't pretend that this law is to make us safer. It's to make their actions less illegal. But I don't think it makes, as I said, it, they haven't said this is a response to the Harkat decision. This is a response to the Rizik decision. We've been waiting for a chance to do it, and we've bundled it all up now. I hope you have a different I'm with her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you would reflect on the chill that this uh, can have on the surveillance of legitimate journalists. And I'm recalling, for instance, when six years ago, when um, Democracy Now! journalist Amy Goodman came to the Douglas um, Crossing, uh, uh, she was delayed and questioned about what she would say in her talk to the Vancouver Public Library, and the concern was <coughs> about the Olympics. So, I, uh, Elizabeth, you had mentioned the chill yeah. and about what people say, and I think this is really important with regard to media and how media will be surveilled and are being surveilled. What additional powers does C-51 give them that they didn't have six years well, CSIS didn't have any ability to do what, what Roach and Kent are describing as kinetic powers. In other words, they just collected the information. They didn't have powers to monkey wrench. They didn't have powers to pretend to be somebody else and get into the group and spend a lot of time convincing people in the group. Uh, and of course, we, we know that, they, that, that pretending to be part of a protest group in order to incite violence is, is not exactly unusual uh, in law enforcement. They, they had an infiltrator who was trying to convince Weibo Ludwig to use explosives. They had they blew up a well. Yeah, they and blew up a well him. in Alberta. They also they also I mean, when you think about the Sûreté Québec, Sûreté du Québec posed as protesters at Chateau at the at the uh, Security Prosperity Partnership meeting in Chateau Montebello. They were the only ones holding rocks and threatening violence, and were the, they were Sûreté du Québec officers. So again, it, it sounds paranoid. It, except that you use historical examples that are recent, or I try to use historical examples that are recent to say, we know they're already doing these kinds of things. What additional things can they do? Well, CSIS can do more without a warrant, and it won't just be RCMP officers underground, it'll be CSIS agents underground, and they also can operate overseas, and in collecting information on people, planting evidence on people, people who believe, this is one of the reasons for oversight, the mantra of the intelligence community on overst oversight is trust but verify. Because well-meaning officers can get very excited about what they're doing and lose track of the importance of the rule of law. We have lots of examples of this sort of thing happening, which is why you need proper oversight. Without oversight and with such broad sweeping powers and with a lack of clarity around definitions, you will get a, a, a a chill on speech. It definitely could affect journalists because if they're going to be, for instance, covering something said by someone, given that the definitions of uh, terrorism offenses in general, recklessly, uh, or you know, you're not, you know, there's no requirement for what the law is required, but it's called mens rea. You don't have to actually intend that what you said results in someone committing a terrorist act. You merely have to be, in some way, saying something that might inadvertently get someone to commit a terrorist act, and there's 
there's no requirement, let me, or the rest of the definition is, while knowing that any of those offenses will be committed or being reckless as to whether any of those offenses may be committed as a result of such communication is guilty of an indictable offense. So if you, if you as a journalist are interviewing someone who's part of, you know, if you look in the historical context, part of the ANC and working with Nelson Mandela, that would qualify as uh, in, in, inducing terrorism in general, and then you're, you're guilty of the terrorist propaganda information, and then you can pull that information or arrest someone or put them in jail for an indictable offense. Uh, you, you do have, I mean, obviously at some point, by the time you're actually arrested, you've got rule of law kicking in, and we hope, unless you're stuck on a security certificate forever and never know the charges against you. The combination of things sets up a very, um, well, this is another Conrad Black line. He said, if, Canada, if, if we don't wake up, or if we continue to sleep, we'll wake up in a despotic regime. Can you believe this? Conrad Black. A despotic <laughs> regime like Argentina, Turkey, or Louisiana. Those are his examples. Anyway, so here we go. I'm just going to, to answer the, the, the specifics of the question. Things happen at the border that don't actually happen in Canada. We know that. We know we can be searched at the border. We have to answer questions at the border. It's an area where uh, the actual official, official, the officer who is there, has a remarkable amount of discretionary power. The, the organization I belong to, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, <coughs> for years has said, in order that things be straightened, there has to be oversight of the CBSA. It's, they've demanded firearms to be like the police. Let them be overseen like the police. A woman has died recently in Vancouver in the hands of the CBSA. Let's have some oversight to make sure that that doesn't happen. I mean, that's, that's what's behind the, the criticism of, of this bill, but it goes much, it, it goes much broader. Um, can I have a question at the back there, then you will answer whatever. When it comes to uh, the treaty rights, the, the agreement that we're in with the Crown, does this mean because the Indian Act is OC51 now that I'm a criminal again? <laughs> Criminalism is a step that would assume, if I take the literal definition, that you've actually committed a crime by being First Nations. It doesn't go that far. But if well, you're. If we're if, together again. Yeah. Around their throat. Yeah. And it's yeah. deemed as being anti government. That's right. Yeah. If, if, you're blocking, if you're blocking a pipeline, <laughs> if you're participating in nonviolent civil disobedience, nothing in this act defends the rights of nonviolent civil disobedience. So the people around the campfire with you uh, could be CSIS agents, they could be, they also try to obtain evidence from other persons and the warrants that the judges can issue when they think they're about to break the law include obtaining evidence from other persons. It creates a vast web. Oh, and that's the other reason why it would be, in, not in your case, but if suppose they were infiltrating someone who was actually, might commit an offense, they, also can provide, CSIS can provide permanent immunity from having to give evidence to any of their confidential sources, which can, this is one of the reasons that other experts so say this bill won't make us safer. Law yeah. to, to protect our grounds, our waters, our air. By doing this, in a peaceful way that we do, in sharing yeah. our, our vast earth yeah. with everyone, I can be deemed a criminal to be. We'll, uh, we will, I would like to say, myself included, am contemplating getting arrested to block any pipeline that wants to come along. And by imagining doing that, and by being determined to do that if the time came, we would be participating in something that could be seen, even under the CSIS definition of a threat to security, which applies to part four, as, as a threat to property. That part that's against the interests of the security of Canada and Canada's interests, since Harper has repeatedly defined pipelines as in Canada's national interest, he's conflated patriotism with petroleum. So we're all going to be in the same boat. And if I'm going to be in a boat, I'd rather be in your boat than in his boat, but I don't like the idea. <laughs> about the woman who was asking about public scrutiny. 
Um, because the other thing that surprised me in this bill was Joanne read the whole thing. I did. <laughs> she was Full supposed marks. to be resting. <laughs> but you know, we know as journalists in my okay. <laughs> For a court, a judge to kick you out of the court, yeah. which does happen if we have underage uh, people who are being tried or if there's something that they feel is not in the best interest of the public. But you always have to apply to put the, the, the public out, the journalists out. This has a, a section in it that says the public can be excluded solely on the whim of the judge who thinks it is in the interest of public morals, maintenance, of order or proper administration of justice, or is necessary to prevent injury to international relations or national defense. <laughs> Bottom line is, if the judge has a reason, there's no challenge. Yeah. We've always been able to challenge it. There's, there's a field of, of law that journalists have had to fight a long time. I, my worry about this bill is the balance between security and scrutiny, as everyone's been saying. You need to have scrutiny if you're going to have increased security. And this just doesn't happen. And, and that's in the case when you might otherwise imagine people would be in the court. The process of applying for these warrants to federal to court judges, those hearings are all in camera and ex parte, which means nobody will ever know about them. This is a topic I wanted to ask about. Um, so I'm taking it as a given that we're placing ourselves in their hands by doing uh, civil disobedience. What would the possible consequences that they could apply okay. at that point? Does, it, does the act say, or is that just sort of something somebody pulls out of the air? If the act has all kinds of things about putting you on warrant, yeah. or on a security certificate if they suspect you of this, and they don't have to take you to trial, they just have to make the case if someone, for example, makes a complaint about you, and you could be on that for 12 months with no jurisprudence. Yeah. I mean, that would be like just That's right, off that's the a screen. security certificate process. Yeah. I was thinking also of if you were, for instance, to be seen to have had or promoted uh, propaganda, and I think it's very interesting that, that uh, ter propaganda for <coughs> terrorism in general could be a sign. It, would this graphic be such a sign? Right? What does that mean? A sign, a symbol. Uh, it's it's absolutely so vague. And that by the, that's one of the sections which is I have a different marker for that one. I think punishable by imprisonment for ten years. Is that the one that's ten years? Ten years. So that's and the other problem is I was going to mention in terms of how much trouble could people be in. Um, yeah, it's a liable for imprisonment of a term of not, I'm sorry, not more than five years. I exaggerate, only five years. But um, I wanted to double check. But one of the things is if you should happen to be a dual citizen, and this is where the citizenship, concept of citizenship in this country is getting very, very murky, is they passed a law that says they can strip people of citizenship, as Donald said. There's a, there's a global convention that you can't create a stateless person. But if they can make the case that someone has any connections to another country sufficient to say they're a dual citizen, whether they think of themselves as that or not, they can both, uh, you know, uh, you know and after what happened to Maher Arar, um, with, with being snatched and taken to another country to be tortured, uh, I, th I think we're entering an area where the fundamental notions that we live in a free society under the rule of law with the protection of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms becomes a thing of the past. That's the problem. The specific examples and the hypotheticals are almost endless. And what they're appealing to here is a base political crowd that says, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to worry. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very worrying thought. And, and we have to find ways to express it more clearly than I am right now, that having the right, having liberties and, the, and operating under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is rather fundamental to living in a free and democratic society. And in a free and democratic society, we can also confront the threat of terrorism. We can protect ourselves from people who wish to do us harm. It's not one or the other. In fact, the protections of a democratic and free society run absolutely uh, in, in um, 
harmony with goals of creating public security and safety. They're not in opposition. But like everything Harper does, it's oppositional. You want the environment, then you can't have the economy. You want the economy, you want freedom, or you can't, if you want security, you can't have liberty. Don't try to have both. It's one or the other. And only people who have something to hide are going to complain about this law. Says the man in the closet. Thank you. Says the man in the closet. Yes. So, um, at the back there, the black sweater, then Matthew, and then we have a question in this area.
and it was right after C51 was tabled, and they had 82%, I think was the number, of, uh, based on their poll, that supported C51. But Angus Reed's methodology is an online survey where everybody's the same group of, I think, about 1,700 people across Canada who've agreed to answer Angus Reed's questions online. So I, I don't think it's reliable, but I do think that Stephen Harper wants us to be very afraid, wants us to think we're at war, wants us to think that anyone who opposes this, and you're absolutely right, the reason that the Liberals are at this point cowardly on this bill, and I hope they'll find their feet, but the reason is they're entirely afraid, not of terrorism, they're afraid of the election, mm -hmm. and, and they're afraid of what happens if something happens that looks like a terrorist attack, and Harper's able to look at them and say, you didn't want to take the steps that would have prevented it. Hmm. And that's their fear. Can I, I'd like to answer your question by um, being an old fart. <laughs> uh, when I was growing up, there was, there was a way of making legislation. And how legislation was made was, first of all, a green paper would be introduced. And a green paper is a set of policies and ideas pushing in different directions. Let's get some political discussion about which way we're going to go. Let's open it up. Then there would be a white paper. And the white paper would recognize the importance of the general principles, and then identify the certain recommendations so the government was getting information. So by the time this came onto your desk, comes out of your printer, you would actually be able to look at it and understand it. If you've been following all this beforehand, if the legislative pro uh, process had been working, you would be able to look at section four and say, I get it. I know where, I know where they're coming from. I disagree, but I get it. I think you pick up Bill C-51, you look at this, and you just say, and I know I do, and I'm trained, I don't understand this. Where are they coming from? I just don't get it. And so you have to sit and you think, okay, what are they thinking about? And that's why some of our, some of our ideas about what they're trying to do may be wrong, but at least we know where it's coming from. But today, bang, it's here. And you know, thank God for sabbaticals and, and training camps uh, uh, at time that they can actually spend going through it and they're the experts in the field because the rest of us actually don't. How can we make an opinion on whether we approve of Bill C-51 without having read it? it that's yeah, and I, I, very few of us, in, I mean, I'm, as a member of parliament, I've read it over and over again to try to make sense of it. Certain sections I recognize right away as terrifying. Other sections, <coughs> such as section five, I needed Donald Galloway to decode it for me. But uh, it, it, isn't, it, it isn't reasonable to have had closure on debate in second reading within days. The fight in committee to have witnesses, by the way, the process in the committee, this gets into some arcane procedural bits, but the, the conservatives on the committee have a conservative chair of the committee looking at public safety. And the NDP were doing a great job filibustering and blocking, closing this to move on to witnesses until they could get <coughs> enough time for enough witnesses to have any possibility of being able to claim the bill had been adequately studied. And when there was no right under the procedures of that committee to do so, the conservatives on the committee said, calling the question, we got to end up committee chair said, no, the, basically the NDP have the floor, this is not an opportunity to call the question. Then the conservative members challenged their own chair and voted him down and ended the hearings. So this is another sub-issue that when we get back to Parliament Monday morning, uh, the speaker will probably have to rule on that first, but there are a lot of conservative backbenchers who are upset about all this as well. So I mean, I know we're going off on a, on a bit of it, but you can't possibly, this bill should not be at, in committee at second reading without an explanation. And of course, the further insult to Parliament is, was it delivered to us in Parliament? No, it was delivered to a campaign rally in Richmond Hill where the Prime Minister used the word jihadism over and over and over again, which is, of course, itself an act of reckless insensitivity and intolerance. Yeah.
make 